I call to order uh, the October 2023 meeting of the Finance and Operations Committee of the University of Minnesota Board of Regents. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you to those who are joining uh, us live stream video and those attending in our boardroom by way of Zoom. I'd like to also welcome our student representatives, representatives for today, uh, Cole Groshan from Duluth and Flora Yang from the Twin Cities campus. Okay, our first item this afternoon is to act on the interim president's recommended 2023 six-year capital plan and the 2024 state capital crest. Let me welcome our interim president, uh, uh, Jeff Attinger, Senior Vice President Franz, and Vice President uh, Roberts Davis. Uh, interim President uh, Jeff Edger, please take it away. Thank you so much, Chair Hibsch and members of the committee. The purpose of this item is to act on the interim president's recommended 2023 six-year capital plan and 2024 state capital request. The 2023 six-year capital plan includes the major capital improvements we have planned for calendar years 2024 through 2029. Since we were here in September for review, there are only two very minor changes, and Vice President Roberts Davis will walk us through those in a moment. Additionally, we have the 2024 state capital request, which outlines the submission of the university that will be made to the state for consideration during the 2024 legislative session. This remains unchanged since our last meeting. You may recall that since we shared our preliminary request in June, we shifted our strategy as a result of a series of consultation meetings that we held over the summer with chancellors, faculty, deans, students, and staff from across the system. On the capital side, it became clear that we needed to prioritize investments in our existing facilities with the goal of improving the student experience, research competitiveness, and climate sustainability. These items reflect our priority to preserve our existing physical assets in the most cost-effective way possible to support the university's mission, while also aligning with the Impact 2025 strategic system-wide plan. Before I turn the presentation over to Vice President Roberts Davis for a quick overview on these two requests, I'd like to note that there is a line item for the farm project, and I have not had any role in developing or approving that item given my conflict management plan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Vice President, go ahead. Thank you. The presentation. Thank you, Interim President Edinger. Uh, thank you, Chair Hips and members of the board. As Interim President Edinger said, we return to you today with two action items. First, the university's 2023 six-year capital improvement plan, and second, the university's 2024 state capital request, which is also the first year of the six-year capital improvement plan. These two represent uh, three of the core components in our capital investment process that the board is engaged throughout the year on. At their inception, viable projects are added to the six-year capital plan and the state capital request, and then approved by the board. As they are developed and funded, we bring them back to the board in the spring as part of the annual capital budget, which is the third component of the capital investment process that I mentioned earlier. There are, of course, some projects that do not move forward and some that don't follow those timelines cleanly. When that happens, the capital budget amendments come forward and uh, those can happen at any time of the year. We have a couple of those on the consent agenda today. Only after you approve the annual capital budget or an amendment is a project ready to start construction and move on to completion. Back to the six-year capital plan. The plan is required by board policy and is the document that sets the direction for major capital projects. It includes two components. The first component is what we plan to ask the state to fund in the next three sessions. This is our traditional state capital request. The second component is a list of university funded projects that are currently either in the pre-design or design phase and which we plan to advance into design and construction in the next six years. As a reminder, we made changes to the format of the report as well. The first change is that the state request portion of the plan includes only three sessions uh, as a look ahead, and traditionally that was a six session look ahead. Including only the next three sessions allows us enough time to conduct the planning and pre-design work, but avoids raising expectations for projects that may not be funded in the six year timeline. 
The second change is that we have grouped all of the university funded projects by their stage of development rather than by specific years. This new look still shows all of the projects that are likely to advance in the annual capital budget in the next six years as required by board policy. With regard to changes in the actual plan, there have been two minor changes since the last time we were here in September for review. The dining center project at Middlebrook Hall on the Twin Cities campus and the main production kitchen at the Duluth campus were on the list, but they are now approved as part of the capital budget amendment process in the consent report last month, so they have been removed from the list today. So on to the state capital request. For the state capital request, with your approval, we will ask the state for $500 million in higher education asset preservation or HEPR dollar investment to be allocated system-wide using our standard formula that balances total campus square footage with facility condition needs. A significant investment in asset preservation will help achieve the objectives identified through our summer consultation with staff, faculty, and students, as well as the priorities outlined by the board for the six-year capital plan. With that, um, I seek your approval for the six-year capital plan and the state capital request, and I am happy to answer any questions that you may have. Uh, thank you, Sen uh, Senior uh, Vice President Roberts Davis. Uh, before I ask for questions or comments, I want to remind the committee that the changes made last month, the Finance and Operations Committee now has the authority to act on behalf of the board. All of the votes we take today will be to approve the items directly without additional action being taken by the board tomorrow. For this uh, item, there are two resolutions in the docket, one approving the 2023 six-year capital plan and one for the 2024 state capital request. Unless there are any objections, I would like to take the resolutions together as one motion. Are there any objections? Hearing none, is there a motion to approve on behalf of the board of uh, Board the resolution related to the 2023 six-year capital plan and the resolution related to the 2024 State capital request. So moved. Second. Okay. Is there a second? Somebody said okay. over there. Okay. Thank you. Uh, let's turn to discussion. Is there any discussion on the I have, on motion? I have Regent a question. Turner. Okay. Go ahead, Regent Turner. Hi. Thank you. Uh, Chair Heaps. I, I just have a question about where does this, I saw the 500 million and I saw the allocation of 2% and 5% and all that kind of stuff. Where do like special bonding projects come in? If a, if a, like, you know, of specific Morris or Cruxton or Duluth or one of them has a special bonding project. Is that something separate? Uh, Chair Hipsch, uh, Regent Turner, that is a separate line item in typical years. In typical years, we would ask for that money as a special allocation. This year, we're pivoting to asking for all Heber dollars. So if there is something that needs to be repaired or maintained in a building, that's what the funding would be for. But if there's an actual capital project need, that is not funding that we're requesting in this session. Does that answer your question? Unfortunately, yes. Yeah. Regent uh, Gully. Thank you, Chair, and um, thank you so much. I uh, was wondering, how does this compare to um, previous um, asks, like say in the last few years, and how do you, I, I'm just trying to get a sense of like how our legislators are likely to react to this, um, and really without like expectation, I just wanna, I, I, I'm like texting friends in the legislature and saying, hey, what do you like, what do you think? But I'm, I'm curious about how we, like the response that we expect. From it. Uh, Chair Hibsch, Regent Gully, we um, have not previously asked for an all HEPR request mm -hmm. in the past. We usually do ask for some special projects along the way. Uh, the message that we're trying to send is that the situation is such that we really need this asset preservation money. And if we can get the asset preservation money, we won't ask for anything else. Okay. Uh, it's critical for us. And um, we are. We've had conversations with the governor on this. He's very supportive of this ask. We have talked with a number of legislators as well who are also supportive of this and are hoping that we're successful. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Any further follow-up? No. Oh, um, no, not at okay. this time. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Is there any other just Senior Vice President France. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Vice President Robert Stevens, and thanks for the questions. I anticipate overwhelming support by the legislature for this ask. Yep. It's, it's, it's needed, 
It's overdue and it maintains the commitment that the state needs to engage in for our university, uh, University of Minnesota. I happen to know that Minnesota State is engaging in a similar request. Uh, and I also know that the state itself and the state agencies are experiencing similar problems with maintaining asset preservation. So I think uh, in discussions we've had both with legislators and the administration, we're finding fairly strong support for the uh, for the idea of uh, providing this opportunity for the state legislature to to maintain its commitment to higher education facilities. Thank you. Uh, is there any other discussion? There being no further discussion, uh, you appear ready to vote. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, say no. Motion passed. Okay, the second item is to act on the interim president's recommended supplemental fiscal year 2025 state budget request. Interim President uh, Edinger and Senior Vice President Franz and Vice President Tonneson <coughs> will take us through this item. Uh, inter interim President Edinger, would you like to start us off? Thank you again, Chair Hipsch and members of the committee. The consultative process this summer allowed us to get input from the university community on the priorities for the capital budget request to the state, which you just approved, and for a potential supplemental operating budget request. The themes that emerged most prominently through this process make up the basis for our request. First, we need to focus on the needs of students. Secondly, we need to acknowledge and support the needs of our faculty and staff, particularly around issues of compensation. Lastly, we have been and must remain a real economic driver for the state. Therefore, we propose to advance the same request we submitted last year for a $45 million incremental increase to our recurring O&M appropriation beginning July 1, 2024. This would be a 3.3 increase in our biennial base appropriation, which is the way the state keeps track of its budgeting decisions. Instead of our current biennial base of $1.34 billion, it would result in a biennial base of $1.39 billion. This request is simple and direct, and it's consistent with what the legislature heard from the university last year. We believe that coming together as faculty, students, staff, alumni, and regents to actively support this request to meet our core needs will be the right message for the upcoming legislative season. This request remains unchanged since we presented it to you for your review in September. And now, Mr. Chair, I would like to turn, turn it over to Vice President Tonneson to walk us through the, the specifics of our proposal. Thank you, Chair Hipschman, members of the committee. Uh, Interim President Ettinger summarized the proposed supplemental request very nicely. So I will just provide a few added comments on the request itself and the impact the additional funds would have on our budget and our activities. First, however, I'd like to spend just a couple of minutes to back up a bit to talk about the schedule and context of this request to help make sure it's clear how this fits into the other components and other pieces of our budget process. Every two years, in the fall of an even-numbered year, we ask the board to approve a biennial request to the state for consideration during the odd-numbered year session. Depending on what happens with that request, in some biennia, we also develop and submit a supplemental request for consideration during the off year to ask for an increase in the, the appropriation beginning in the second year of the biennium for something that we didn't get in our biennial appropriation. And that is what we are doing today. In addition to the biennial request process, as you are aware, we also engage in an annual budget development process for the university's all funds budget that we ask you to approve each spring. This supplemental request to the state is just one part of that annual budget process because it relates to just one part of our annual revenues, the state appropriation. We will move forward developing the annual budget assuming the already enacted appropriation for FY25 while simultaneously modeling what it could mean if this supplemental request is approved and we end up with more funding than the law currently provides. This supplemental request process is our only way to officially ask for an increase in our state appropriation that feeds our annual budget beyond what was originally appropriated for the biennium. Changes in the other revenue sources will be estimated based on different factors as we go through the process. 
and all of it, state funds plus all the other funds, with or without this potential supplemental appropriation, will be brought together in our recommended annual budget for FY25 that you will see in May and June. So with that context, back to our specific proposal before you today. To reiterate what's been said, it is a simple request. We recommend we resubmit to the state of Minnesota our request for a $45 million incremental increase in our O&M appropriation for next fiscal year for core mission support. As you will recall, the state supported a portion of our core needs in FY24, but the final enacted bill included no increase in our recurring appropriation for FY25. I believe the state does recognize the value of the university in many ways. They often fund very specific program or research related activities, which is true again this biennium with a variety of new grants and transfers coming from uh, appropriations made to other state agencies. But while that type of support provides that added element of excellence in areas where we have great strength and it benefits the state and our students, and it's really very important and appreciated, it does not fully recognize the infrastructure necessary to allow for those activities. The university proposed and still plans, even if this request is fully funded, to help address our core costs through a mix of gains in tuition revenue and internal reallocations or budget cuts. But that red line on this slide, that incremental increase of $45 million to our o and appropriation remains vitally important to help address our needs and will directly impact how drastic our actions will need to be to balance our budget. By supporting the Corps, the state would be helping us to make it possible to continue to provide the world-class instruction students deserve and to provide the academic support services necessary for them to succeed. It will also make it possible to provide wraparound services to address their safety and security needs and their campus life experiences. It will further make it possible to provide research and public engagement activities that result in unique opportunities for students to gain valuable experience. The core is all about making these things possible because it allows us to pay for the technology and facilities and physical equipment and supplies that make instruction and research possible. And it allows us to fairly compensate our employees without whom none of what we do is possible. As we mentioned in September, if the state provides the support, it will allow us to implement lower tuition rate increases for our students than we otherwise would need to consider. It would allow us to maintain services and better address the ever-changing needs of our students. It will allow us to meet more of the demands we have related to our spaces. It will strengthen our efforts to fairly compensate our employees, and it will make implementation of any of the University Senate's recently proposed enhancements to pay and working conditions that much more possible. As I mentioned in September, supporting our core operating costs is truly supporting the heart of the University. We are asking for approval of this proposed request today, and we're happy to answer any further questions you might have. Mr. Chair, thank you. Uh, thank you, Vice President Donison. Before we turn to discussion, is there a motion to approve on behalf of the board the resolution related to the supplemental fiscal year 2025 budget request to the state of Minnesota? Moved. So moved. Is there a second? Somebody said second. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, is there any discussion? There. Kenyan, yeah. Pardon me? Regent Kenyan. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't look that far enough to hey. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, AVP Tonneson, appreciate the presentation. Um, my question is um, about tuition. Um, and I it, correct me if I misinterpreted or heard this correctly. I think you said that uh, with or without the supplemental, um, we're planning for gains in tuition. Um, now that could either be by the number of students or the dollar amount. Um, it's just, I guess I'm just curious, this early, I suppose it's not, it's earlier, but I know you, <laughs> I know right when we pass the first one, you start working on the next one. So let's say earlier in the stage relatively, um, how we can already conclude that um, when, you know, we have this opportunity to present to the legislature a supplemental request. Um, Obviously, we're going to be realistic about, you know, what we ask and what we think we'll get. Um, you know, we don't know um, maybe what that incoming class may look like. Um, so just this early, you know, help me understand why we'd conclude that. And I suppose maybe you meant the number of students, but if it's the dollar amount, I'm just curious about that thinking. Go ahead. 
Chair Hipsch, uh, Regent Kenyanya, it is early, and that is why we don't say exactly what we're going to do. We don't know, right? And so we have a lot of different models on the table, projecting a lot of different things. And so when I made that comment, I'm talking about revenue, not rate necessarily. And so increasing the tuition rate is on the table. There are many options along the continuum there, depending on the costs that we're going to face, which we also don't know today. So it's really keeping it open to the options, but every year, pretty much uh, since I've been here, we have uh, budgeted and planned a tuition revenue increase, whether that be from rate or from enrollment, just natural growth in some of our units. So while some might be decreasing, some might be increasing, and there is that churn. So it's a, it's a safe thing to plan for some tuition revenue growth. Uh, how we get there is up for decision, for sure. Thank you. Any follow up? No, that answered my question. Okay. Thank you. Is there any other discussion? Okay, there being no further discussion, um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, say no. The motion is approved. Thank you. Okay, our third item is to act on the new campus plan for the Duluth campus. Here to answer any final questions you might have are Interim Chancellor David McMillan and Director of Planning Monique McKenzie. Interim Chancellor McMillan, when you get up here, would you like to start us off? Certainly, and uh, thank you, Chair Hipsch, members of the committee. It's a pleasure to be back again. We had a I think this is our third time, and uh, the first time was this summer, June, and then back in September with a much deeper dive and great dialogue with all of you around the plan, and uh, here we are today, uh, hopeful for your ultimate approval, but one last opportunity to ask us some more questions. So, um, Monique, are you going to walk us through what we, what we do have today? Thank you, Interim Chancellor McMillan. Uh, Chair Hipsch, members of the committee, we did go through the docket, uh, sorry, the documents with you at the September Regents meeting. Those full documents, both for campus plan and climate action plan, were in your docket. So I hope you enjoyed at least scrolling through the beautiful illustrations um, because our slides and our content really tells you our big ideas and our recommendations for Duluth's future. Uh, we took on this work of combined campus and climate action planning in response to our strategic system-wide plan, which requires of us that we do long-range physical comprehensive planning, um, as well as climate action plans for each of our locations. And we are pleased to take on this work in a coordinated or integrated way, because we need to strengthen the alignment of our goals for carbon neutrality by 2050 with our physical planning efforts for where we will make investments, how we will expand our campuses, how we will enrich our campuses. As a reminder, the horizons of time we use when we do this planning, we call it near term, which is 15 years, which I know is not very near term, <laughs> but in a bigger scope of climate action and campus development, that is <coughs> a near term. And then our longer term is 30 years. So we think about the campus in 2038 for 15 years, and we think about the campus in 2053 for the longer 30 year horizon. And I guess the other thing I wanted to say, which I've probably said a few times in our visits to you, is that I was um, amazed and so pleased that at Duluth, all of this content was really driven by the values of UMD and the values of our system, but with a tremendous amount of grassroots participation from students in particular, in particular around the questions of climate, I would say, and campus life, and very active and involved leadership under the interim chancellor and his team. So they started at the beginning and they stayed with us through the process, which is great because sometimes that's a bit hard to do. Um, you'll see some reporting on the engagement process in your docket material and also in the plan document itself as you get in there. So I'll just take a moment. We had this uh, for you in your September docket in more detail and I'm happy to answer any questions on the details of this and this is absolutely the postage stamp version summary of what this plan is calling for. Uh, we use the, the rubric of big ideas. So what is the biggest physical change we think uh, we should see on the campus to meet these goals? And I would say that you know, in doing so, in creating these physical plans, we're really wanting to make sure we address the question of growth 
of renewal and of interaction with our surrounding communities. And that's the task we are taking on at every location. We're well underway at Rochester, very different setting, but the same questions are posed to us. Um, it's true that campus plans are aspirational in nature with a horizon like that. Um, and without any, uh, I'll say, obligations to secure the capital for every single one of these projects, we do dream rather large in our scale. Um, but pairing that up with the climate action plans that we need to make so we can think about as owners for the long term, right, what kinds of energy we're using, what kinds of demands we have for that energy, how resilience and adaptation on our campus can really evolve to place the institution in the best possible case. These are all the things that end up, get us to this point of big ideas as shown here. So the biggest one we were all very excited about is a sustainability corridor. And that's the idea, which you can see in the small version of the diagram here, of reusing land on campus, the oldest buildings built in the 50s, the most obsolete, Burnside and Vermilion Hall, halls, taking down those beds and using that footprint of land for recreation to enliven campus life and to create the potential for a geothermal exchange field, which is essential to district heating on the campus, which is essential to being able to rely on electrified supply, which is coming our way in the state of Minnesota. So it creates a hub, a busy destination for social life, not just for students who live on campus, but for anyone coming and going through transit. And it gives us a remarkable opportunity to place geothermal exchange right there in the middle of everything. I think the other piece of sustainability, which is very exciting, and I think we talked about this in September with Regent Tad Johnson, was the connection to the city. It is a gift, this idea, to connect the Hartley to the north, to Chester on the south through campus, whether it's gonna be trails or it's gonna be walking your dog. The idea when we realize this is that the campus belongs to the city, the city belongs to the campus and that connected open space is a great attribute. The second big idea is about the recreation park. Today there are fields on the ground. They're not necessarily the fields UMD needs for recreation and athletic purposes. Concept of rebuilding those fields is to also integrate pedestrian movement from Woodlawn, which is a big corridor and near campus, but to also again create an opportunity for geothermal exchange fields. Those two locations I've just mentioned would allow us, ultimately after a fair amount of capital investment, mm -hmm. to have a complete carbon neutral energy supply system for the Duluth campus. So it's a terrifically powerful big idea because it does many things for us. Greening the campus edge is about the north and south sides of campus, which are really characterized today by quite a lot of surface parking, um, whether it's for the apartments on the north side or it's parking for daily campus use on the south side. And the idea is with small changes, reforestation, consideration when the time comes to build parking structures, we can use that land differently. We can treat stormwater, we can reforest it, increase the carbon capture, make it a more visually appealing um, entrance and exit of campus. And then the fourth big idea, which really reflects the system-wide through to every single set of campus leadership goal about being good stewards of our assets. So reinvesting in the campus core. So there's a number of buildings that are listed on the plan as reinvestment targets. They are also high up on our HEPR priority list for each of those campuses. Those are core buildings that support the academic, the research, the outreach mission. Um, by renovating them, we're not tearing them down necessarily, but by renovating them, it allows us to reduce the demand on our energy systems, and increasing the carbon footprint, and it focuses the energy and life in the core of the campus, which is we know where most people are on a daily basis. So that's a lot of words and a very quick summary of the plan as we've described it to you um, in our prior uh, visits to your committee. And I, at this point, I just wanna turn it back to Interim Chancellor McMillan. Thank you, Director McKenzie. So I will, uh, I won't try to restate anything there, but I wanna highlight a couple things. One, um, this has been an inclusive, extremely well-managed, highly participatory and transparent process led by my colleague here and, uh, and the folks in, in Vice President Alice Roberts Davis group, just been fantastic. So that's one thing to think about. This isn't a one-off that somebody dreamed up. Um, this has is, this is been around the block multiple times. And, uh, and I think while aspirational can be an easy way to dismiss the consequential nature of this, it, it's also directional. And, and it helps us focus priorities. And I want to highlight one 
such priority. If you look through the plan, you'll see a new building on the, uh, the far east side of the campus called a health center. It says new health center next to a, a parking ramp. Um, and in this process, it became apparent to me and to our leadership team, although it's been apparent to them for a while, that we need to really highlight that. And I'm not here to pitch that any further today. I just want you to know that by this process of a giant number of priorities getting narrowed and directionally um, addressed gives me the kind of focus I need to say, look, we gotta, we got to find a path forward for that now before, not that it's going to get built now, but this can't be, can't have a health center that's aspirational in nature. It has to move forward. And, and then lastly, and Monique mentioned this too, but I want to be sure you, you capture this. Item four, reinvesting in the campus core, is just a perfect, perfect fit with what you just approved for the, uh, the HEPA request. Heller Hall, Humanities, and uh, the, uh, what used to be the Health Sciences Library, now is, uh, is the Library Annex, is what you hear it called. Um, those are all opportunities, especially Heller and humanities to invest in buildings that are central to everything about UMD. And as our educational mission evolves and grows and changes, there is no doubt those buildings will be right in the middle of whatever that campus is in 20, 30, 40 years. So that's what I'd leave you with is a sense that uh, this, this dovetails wonderfully with that. And I don't think any of us were thinking you would be approving a heaper only half a billion dollar ask. But uh, boy, if we got a good chunk of that 45 million on this campus, this is where you'd see it invested and it would pave the way for decades to come. Enough from me. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Chancellor McMillan and Director McKenzie. Um, before we uh, turn to discussion, is there a motion to approve on behalf of the board uh, the Duluth campus plan? So moved. Second. It's been motioned and seconded, thank you. Any discussion? Uh, Regent for Halen. Thanks, Chair Hipsch. Um, you know, you, I was going to start somewhere else, but you just mentioned Heller Hall, which felt old when I was there. <laughs> felt really old when Regent Kenyanya was there, and I bet it feels really, really old now for Student Representative Groshong. Um, but looking at this plan every time, um, I've been very impressed with the thought that has gone into campus sustainability and what the future of this campus can look like um, when you know 47 percent of emissions are scope one emissions 44 percent are scope two and scope one is direct combustion emissions so both from on-site heating and cooling fleet some fugitive emissions that come with just operations scope two emissions are secondary, what you're purchasing from electricity. Uh, thinking about how this campus plan has a significant impact on those scope one emissions through the massive changes of the heating and cooling system to geothermal from the traditional fossil fuel, um, I believe it's natural gas and fuel oil now. Um, it to tie a few themes I've talked about in our sustainability conversations, it will take a significant amount of capital. I mean, th these are not cheap systems to install. It will also take a significant amount of time transitioning over from a system that supports combustion generated heat to a geothermal passive heating and cooling system is something that takes time. And I think it's really important that we all be really aware of that. This isn't something that can, even if we got the money tomorrow, this isn't something that could be done by 2025. Um, this is something that will take years of planning, even if you didn't have to remove burnt side and vermilion halls. Um, and so I think, you know, from a magnitude standpoint, it's really important to remember that, but also that capital investment greatly changes the O&M costs going forward for that system, which I think is such an important investment in future generations. And I try not to speak for a long time here, but I also wanted to take an opportunity to just express my appreciation for coming forward with a plan that really takes a close look at what's happening there. And knowing that on top of that, um, with the governor's 
enactment of the 2040 bill where electricity becomes 100% carbon free and with um, the energy partner at UMD making those commitments as well. I know you know it intimately, <laughs> Interim Chancellor McMillan from your prior life, but thinking about these charts, and I'm looking at page 40 of the actual booklet, the PDF booklet we were given, um, page 86 of 290 of the presentation materials, uh, the docket materials, but those charts, the yellow and purple lines will basically go to zero. Um, and to think about what a massive change that is, I think is really important for all of us to just kind of take a minute and sit in and think about the impact that that can have going forward um, for the campus, its community, but also more broadly future generations. And so thank you, but also wanted to give you an opportunity to talk about any of that if, if there was anything additional you wanted to say. Chair Hipsch and Regent Verhalen, what I would add there is uh, appreciate that, uh, that compliment. And between a natural gas-fired steam heating system and a full someday conversion to geothermal probably lies an interim step. Almost certainly those boilers won't last until we have that kind of opportunity to convert would be hot water which again is more efficient, less environmentally you know, uh, consequential. And uh, the way the campus is set up, I think there's four main steam lines that come out and we would do those in phases. So that's probably how we're gonna have to swallow this in bites as we go forward. But again, it's all progress. And as you noted in scope two in 17 years, we're, you know, our partner has taken care of that at, uh, in the utility side of it. So uh, Director McKenzie, did I characterize that right? Uh, absolutely, Interim Chancellor McMillan, uh, Chair Hipsch, Regent Verhillen. I think the other thing that's great about ongoing work, so how does a campus plan and climate action plan relate to energy planning? In order to break it down into the steps more precisely, what is it we do to make this massive task doable from a cost, yes, but also a series of events. So the climate action plan for Duluth lays out sort of the geography and the rough you know, steps that need to be taken, but the work's currently underway for an energy master plan. So uh, Twin Cities Energy Management working alongside UMD Facilities Management is really starting to test the details, which is very gratifying because we can put aspirational, really important plans that are very well considered, as I believe this one is, um, no thanks to me. Um, <laughs> but if we don't actually test the details, we can't deliver it. Uh, we do have a huge task ahead to secure capital, but we have to know, even at this level, that it's essentially going to be a doable thing. And that's what this team, the benefit of their work with us is they have great team members and they work very well alongside us. So it's a good combination. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to pile on because I, I love this plan too. I think it's very futuristic looking. I think students are going to want to come there um, and that's going to solve a lot of our problems. You know, it's just a, it does everything. You know, it's a beautiful plan and uh, hopefully we can get to it and get follow it. You know what I mean? We have the money to follow it and we can actually get it done because it's going to pay a lot of dividends for the state. So uh, is there any other discussion? Oh, I just Regent Turner. Yeah. Regent Turner. Uh, thank you, Chair Hips. Um, so I've, I've had the good fortune so far actually to be to Morris and Crookston twice and going to get to Duluth. Um, and I look forward to Duluth where you all can bring me down to where your boilers are and explain what you've got and all that kind of stuff. And I did get, a, we, at, when we were at Crookston, we did get a bird's eye view into what their system was. And so I, I can now relate to what you're talking about that this isn't just something that can be done in a year or whatever. Um, so my overall question, even though we're focusing on D Duluth, all of our other campuses have got to make this transition too. And my question is, um, you know, when you look at that 500 million and 413 of the million coming to the Twin Cities and then the other four cam three, four campuses divvying it up, how, how, do, you how do we envision Duluth, Morris, um, Crookston, I think Rochester, you got you guys all figured out over there. You just rent buildings or whatever. But anyway, how, how, do we, how do we move all of this? You know, because like in Crookston, and I'm sure it's the same with you guys, they're talking about 
you know, Regent Turner, this is like a 15 year project or something like that. Do we have that amount of time to be able to Good question. Uh, Take that President long? Where do we get the money? Uh, he'll try to answer your questions. So. <laughs> thank you, Chair Hips, and thank you, uh, Regent Turner. No, it's an excellent question, and, and one of the things that um, you have to recall is that we're going, uh, the, the request for money from the legislature for 24 is just for 24. It's not for years thereafter. Uh, we, we have an ongoing uh, request, a management of what we think we need long term. Uh, part of what we try to do is uh, as a university is understand where do those dollars need to be spent first because some of these facilities are in dire need uh, more than other facilities so we have to figure that out for example we didn't anticipate what would happen to the Northrop roof in this last winter now we're lucky in that regard terrible that it happened and it was covered by insurance because it was a catastrophic event but nonetheless the ability to predict those kinds of things is difficult and what what the HEPA funds do, the asset preservation funds do, is to try to anticipate uh, our team is really talented in terms of managing and keeping the facilities clean and dry and operational. They actually keep things going longer than they in many ways probably should because they're so talented. And we try to figure out well, where, are those, where do those dollars need to go next. So we will be continually monitoring what happens. So if we were to get all 500 million dollars in this uh, next session, it would go to the list that we have for the current list, but then uh, that's just for this next year. We will continue to look for special projects. For example, some of these larger projects like the uh, the um, heating uh, facility in Crookston is a probably a special project, not out of HEPA. I mean, it could be, HEPA funds could be used to, to do that, but if you look at what might be an alternative energy source, which would be expensive, would require a larger project and probably a special project we'd ask the legislature to help with. Okay. So that we try to balance both the use of asset preservation for those ongoing things that, that we know are there, we know that need to be done, and then we stop every now and then, usually every year, and have special projects that are taken, like the um, chemistry building, the laboratory building, that was a special project we felt really needed to have that kind of emphasis. So um, heaper money goes toward maintaining what's there and the special projects usually go to building something new or adding on something significant. So that's, that's a great question. It's part of what we think about a lot all the time is how do we manage what needs to get done and what needs to get done next? And how do we equitably discharge that among all five campuses? As a follow-up? As a, a follow-up, and I've said this before and I'll say it for the whole six years I'm here. As a registered nurse, safety, and health is always gonna be my top concern. So hopefully those are top concerns when it comes to uh, how we rank things. Thank you. Uh, Rep uh, Student Representative Groshaw. Thank you, Chair Hipsch. Um, again, like I said last month, I just wanna compliment the administration on this plan. I think students are mostly of one mind on the positive reception of it, including me. Um, my question is, in the past, our master plans, to my knowledge, and I ask you to correct me if I'm wrong, have always been relatively aspirational. They've asked for quite a lot. Um, how is UMD, and if we do not get the required funds we need for this plan, how is UMD planning to supplement what we need for necessities, for example, like the health center or for HVAC? Chair uh, Hips, Student Representative Groshong, you have a better than uh, average sense of what's, uh, what's needed on that campus as you walk the halls and uh, the grounds every day. Um, I'm gonna answer that around the health center just to try to give it something other than a, a theoretical. We, we, we're gonna need to fund an awful lot of that through a more traditional model of probably student fees, which may not be the answer you want, but that's how those have traditionally been funded. But we're not locking ourselves into that. And what we've already started in that case with, with the team from uh, facilities management here in Minneapolis is what could we afford, what could you afford as a student and build a base plan and then ideally if we're gonna build that facility, what should we do and what other funding mechanisms might there be, whether they're philanthropic, whether they're university debt, whether they are uh, legislative, which is not a place we've typically gone for student funded. But my point to you and all of the regents is we're trying to think very differently about this. Rules that might have applied like no legislative support for something that's fee supported, 
you heard a conversation earlier today around the policy coming together between tuition and, and fees, different ways to look at it. So we're going to be aggressive and mindful of the fact that we can't, you know, double our student fee and expect to have students be able to and their families shoulder that. But it, there would be a student fee impact for that one. The rest of them, the bigger the heaper, you wouldn't see that. That's on the state and the university. Hope that got you there. But <clears throat> Dr. Hipsch, can I, sorry, can I oh, just- Go ahead, uh, sure, yeah. Dr. Hipsch, um, Student Representative Grashung. I think the other thing for us as an owner, a long-term owner who thinks about life cycle costs, and this is not as relevant maybe to the health services, we can't just find net new money to do net new things. We have to start contracting in other parts of our enterprise in the bricks and mortar world. I'm talking about buildings and space. So my point in this plan, as we'll see with every plan, which of the buildings we're gonna renovate so their energy systems perform better, so we consume less energy, which is less cost after we make the first capital. Which buildings are we gonna demolish? Reducing our footprint is very important to us because it allows the same pool of resources to take us farther. In this case, we have two um, obsolete housing sites we would demolish. And then in a third case, the plan calls for disposition of a very charming building that is completely ill-suited to its current use, the research lab building at the old main campus, original Duluth campus. So our plans, when we think about physical change, need to talk about renew, remove, and dispose because we have to work on how we hold the physical inventory of bricks and mortars, bricks and mortar. Otherwise, we can't use the same amount of money to the same end. So that's very much in our mindset as we do this work. Hmm. Thank you. Um, there being no further discussion, you appear ready to vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, say no. Uh, the motion is approved. We will now take a 10 minute recess. Thank you. <laughs>
Eight years old. And then, even then we kind of went. Okay, we're going to call back to order uh, the Finance Committee. Our fourth item today is a discussion of university job structure, past, present, and future. Hmm. Here to lead the discussion are Vice President uh, Horseman and Senior Director Mary Roman Cool. Vice President Horseman, would you please proceed? Uh, thank you, Chair Hipsch, members of the board. Uh, this is really a two-parter, and the second part comes in February where uh, we have on the agenda the evolution of the university's employment structure. So today we are going to focus more on the present and a little bit on the future and what's happened in the recent past. But we thought it would be a good primer to sort of not only talk about the job structure, um, which really can't compare with the Duluth uh, visionary map that was just in front of us probably. <laughs> uh, but. Uh, there is a story in each of these employee groups that we hopefully can convey as, as well. So, uh, you know, well-defined job structures do provide more than just an idea of pay to market conditions. And while that's certainly critical and we all feel it's, it's one of the most important aspects, another very important aspect of a well-defined structure is that it allows leadership supervisors and employees to develop and adjust a workforce strategy that supports the university mission, role definition, career paths and planning, and credible data analysis. Today, Mary and I are going to walk through the current job structure for labor-represented civil service, P&A faculty, and senior leadership at the university. Mary and her team in the Office of Human Resources uh, on the compensation team, along with many, many partners in the university community have committed significant time in recent years improving the definition of work at the university for civil service and P&A job families and recently for UEA faculty position. The work continues today currently with the research job family along with the discussion upcoming with faculty senate leadership on how to define the market for non-union faculty. There is more to come and there is a need when we do this work and complete it to update it annually. So it is always in a uh, some state of a dy dynamic process. As mentioned, job structures provide the basic and very important details of roles and pay, as this slide would point out. They ensure that classifications are equitable and accurate. They provide a clear picture of the workforce. They show what skills and education each position might require, and then how that relates to what their future career might hold. It also allows us to pull in market-based pay ranges for each position that shows how we are to market. Yet the importance of the structure is not limited to this information, but the fact that it should bring forward a broad discussion and support planning to utilize these roles across the university system in a way that supports our mission and also does so with the most sound fiscal stewardship possible. For instance, when we understand the skills and education required for a position, how does that information inform any changes to the descriptions we use for certain roles? And in turn, does it actually change the pool of candidates that should be qualified for the job <coughs> internally or even externally? So it, it really does support a, a principle such as inclusivity. The university uses different job structures, obviously, tailored for each of our different employee groups. Um, and prior to 2015, the university did not have job families actually tied to the market for civil service and P&A positions. Between 2010 and 2016, an exhaustive job family project was undertaken to address this challenge. It was a challenging and difficult change for the university after many years of not taking that project on, but it was necessary. And at the end of this work, a broad platform was created, which then allowed us to move forward with the refinement we speak of today of the new families and at the same time, develop a credible and rich survey database for the university to use for various markets. 
This is a very high level bird's eye view of the overall percentages of the employee groups uh, of the total population. That obviously does not provide context of the broad spectrum of work that is done for each of our job families by our labor represented employees or our faculty. Within each employee group, there is a great differentiation in work and purpose. While civil service and P&A positions make up 45% of the employment, and um, it may be automatic to think these are administrative roles, that's truly not the case. Many of these positions include staffing for direct academic support, lecturers, instructors, teaching specialists, postdoctoral associates make up a significant portion of that total. While we have reported to the board as required on senior leadership, faculty, civil service, and P&A employee groups, we have addressed our labor represented employees when a new agreement is brought before the board. It has not been a requirement for annual reporting. We would recommend the addition of this critical employee resource to our annual reporting uh, to describe their, their uh, contribution to the university and the status of their employment. With the organization of the Graduate Assistant Union and the collective bargaining underway with GLUUE, the university will have over 8,000 labor represented employees under contract um, because of the population the GAs represent. While this slide says 10 unions, that was before the graduate union, so we actually have 11 right now. Uh, we do have three uh, separate contracts with AFSCME as the um, descriptions in parentheses would show. Our printers actually have two unions, uh, two contracts within their, their um, represented uh, body. And it ranges from uh, over 2,000 employees represented by the three ASME locals to four employees for printers and one employee for broadcast technicians. And uh, he is a very important employee and supports all the work that goes on in these meetings. Um, Ask Me by itself has three separate locals, as we said, clerical and office, technical and healthcare. Clerical and technical together have 77 core job titles. Together, the three units have over 2,000 employees with the predominance of the population in clerical and office. Job structures have a hierarchy, and to make sure those structures are consistent across many different job titles. The university uses a 52 question survey called a job evaluation questionnaire or JEQ. The JEQ has been used by the university since it was developed within the university in 1986. Managers and employees answer questions about a position's job duties, which result in various points being awarded. Certain point thresholds are associated with different job levels. Examples of the critical roles played by clerical office and technical employees include office support, which can mean working with medical records, data entry, office assistance, mail processing, survey interviews, cashiers, inventory services, program or project specialists, and more. For technical workers, their jobs can cover a spectrum of critical work, including lead security advisors, dispatchers, animal care technicians, community service officers, museum assistants, 4-H program assistants, photographic lab technicians, athletic coaching assistants, veterinary techs, library assistants, and many, many more. Ask me healthcare and Teamster job titles, on the other hand, are typically individual roles in healthcare or for Teamsters, most commonly two level job hierarchies noted as regular and senior. For these roles, we use a different survey called the job review questionnaire. It is a more simple process that evaluates the position more broadly to determine if a person is performing senior level duties. Both health care and Teamsters provide critical support to the university. And during the emergency time frame of the pandemic, these two employee uh, groups accounted for a significant number of our on-site workers who took on that challenge and risk to serve the university. Healthcare workers can be dental assistants, pharmacy techs, nursing assistants. They can work in medical labs and in admissions 
and of course, many additional roles. Teamsters can work in a number of building and ground roles caring for athletic fields, gardens. They are maintenance techs and mechanics. They are our parking attendants, take care of our farm animals, make the ice at our arenas, handle deliveries, work in our dining halls, cook the meals for our students, care for vehicles that the university owns. They paint, repair, perform plumbing and carpentry of different natures and operate equipment. We, ha we have additional unions that are currently under contract and in negotiation. Uh, the first being United Education Association, which represents, of course, our faculty on the Crookston and Duluth campuses. As you may know, we are currently moving to mediation with the first date set for November 14th. We are hopeful that the mediation process will allow both sides to move forward toward a mutual agreement. This agreement covers tenure track faculty and also term faculty on the Crookston and Duluth campuses. The law enforcement union has ranks of police officer, sergeant, and currently there are 60 employees represented by LELS on the Twin Cities and Duluth campuses. The commitment and tireless work of our officers, as we've noted in past meetings, has resulted in improved safety and security at the university and the surrounding community. As someone who offices each day in the Dinky Town area, as many of our central administrative team does, it is not hard each day to see many examples of our UMPD supporting the safety and care of our students, our employees, and our community. Our craft and trades on the Twin Cities campus are covered under our agreement with the Minnesota State Building and Construction Trades Council, which represents 19 different buildings and trade unions. The council was recognized by the State Bureau of Mediation in 1981 to represent Crate and Traffs Unit 2. And this consists of 287 um, trades, such as operating engineers, carpenters, plumbers, iron workers, cement masons, and more. Um, trade, you, Craft and Trades Unit 2 is also where the separate agreements live for the broadcast technicians and the printers. In Duluth, we also have additionally 15 positions that are currently in negotiation with the university to establish the first contract of that nature with that uh, population. And we are at a point where we have proposals uh, to discuss uh, with that body. The contract with GLUUE for our graduate assistance is just at the start of negotiation. We have had now, uh, we had our second negotiation uh, session today that went well as, as far as I've heard. And the earlier one was on September 11th um, last month. We will have another meeting tomorrow and two more at the end of October and there are four scheduled for November. The number of graduate assistants that will be re represented historically has ranged between 4,300 and 4,800. And without getting into the, the weedy details, the intersection of when a graduate assistant is a student and when they are an employee will be a primary point of discussion at the bargaining table uh, because uh, we do need to understand that division, but obviously there are some areas where things you know, intersect and we wanna be um, mindful of that. <laughs> Both the university and GLUUE are committed to an agreement that supports GAs and the critical work and study that they do at the university. It is so important to get this contract right and that nature of the academic with the employment uh, makes this a unique process and experience from any others. And to note that on our bargaining team, we have three, we have four associate deans from the colleges that have a large number of graduate assistants. Um, and so uh, the funding that pays the, uh, for the graduate assistant positions is always also more complex than what we would probably see in other labor negotiations. And we have some of our um, more experienced financial managers from 
schools that have uh, IGA populations engaged in the support of this process too. So when we make a proposal or we review one, we truly understand the impact that it's going to have um, and make the right decisions. Overall, the structures in place for our labor represented employees provide equity across job titles and a clear picture of the workforce. Job requirements and career paths are well defined. Jobs in each of the unions have a salary scale with the rates of pay being negotiated, which inherently keeps salary ranges in line with the market. And at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Senior Director Roman Kuhl to talk to us about civil service, professional and academic and administrative roles. So for civil service and P&A positions, we use a different job structure. Um, civil service employment is governed through civil service rules. The Civil Service Consultative Committee and the Vice President of Human Resources review those rules as needed to recommend updates, ensuring that intervals between updates never exceed three years. The recommended amendments are then presented to the board for review and approval. The committee, um, the committee and vice president are given this authority by the Constitution of the Civil Service Senate and the 1945 Basic Law of the Civil Service as approved by the board. None of you were on the board then. <laughs> <laughs> 1945. So P&A employment <laughs> is governed by university policy, and that represents the largest employee group within the university. So until uh, 2013, civil service rules were evaluated using the JEQ that Ken mentioned. Um, there was no formal job structure, however, for PNA positions. And since then, with the implementation of then President Kaler's Operational Excellence Plan, OHR launched a massive job family study. It analyzed all civil service and PNA positions and categorized them into job families. And we now have 20 job families, which you can see here. Civil service employees perform critical roles across these 20 job families, including roles like IT user support, mailroom supervisor, one-stop one specialist. And P&A employees, they fulfill roles that are administrative in nature, as well as roles that directly support our mission, <clears throat> such as researchers, extension educators, lecturers, and education program specialists. Each position was and continues to be assigned to one of eight or nine levels in each of these job families. The jobs are leveled based on varying degrees of complexity and problem solving, independence and in decision making, and scope. The levels within the HR job family are shown here, um, just as an example. The initial job family studies were completed in 2015, and they provided clear and consistent leveling of civil service and PA positions minimum qualifications for each um, level, and more clear career paths. This first generation job family structure was definitely needed, but it was lacking in some respects. Titles for employees, for example, were too broad. They didn't tell us what work um, an employee was performing. For example, in HR, a title like HR Professional 2 or HR Professional 4 it showed the level of responsibility, but didn't show if a person was working in benefits or talent acquisition. And that was very important to be able to distinguish when running reports about our workforce composition. As a result of that, salary ranges also didn't accurately reflect the market for each of those specialties within the job family. Again, for example, the previous HR professional to market midpoint at the time pictured here in green was 58,000. However, an HR professional too in our HR contact center at that time should have had a range midpoint or market median of 46,000. Compensation, 66,000. Talent acquisition, 71,000. So this 58,000 was not an accurate midpoint for any of these particular HR specialties. Not having this detail made it very hard to easily and accurately answer questions about our workforce, and also about our salary expenses. To create a more accurate picture, the OHR Compensation Department embarked on another major project in 2018 titled Market Refinements. This project has refined our job family structures by adding specialties to the end of each job title, 
and providing market-based salary ranges for each job, which are updated annually to reflect the market. We're nearing the end of this project with just four job families that are yet to be refined. This more detailed job structure model is regarded as best practice in the industry, and it's considered one of the more sophisticated job structures among higher education institutions. Compared to our first job family structure, it checks all of the boxes for job title equity, giving us a clear picture of our workforce, defining education and experience requirements, and providing competitive market-based salary ranges. Faculty jobs are structured by rank of assistant, associate, and full professor. This includes both union and non-union faculty. Faculty members typically conduct their teaching and research around a primary discipline, but just like with our pre-refined job family structures, these disciplines are not reflected in the job code, titles, or employee records of our faculty. This makes it difficult to run um, reports easily on how many faculty we employ in various fields, for example, economics versus architecture. The absence of a primary discipline in our faculty job codes, titles, and records also prevents us from connecting an accurate market median salary to these <coughs> positions. We currently provide a general salary floor of $23.89 per hour for all professor ranks and $20.61 per hour for instructors. It would be far more advantageous to know how each faculty member by rank of assistant, associate, and full professor is paid relative to the market for their unique discipline, including disciplines that range from painting to mechanical engineering. A work group composed of OHR, Duluth leadership, and Duluth UEA representatives completed market refinements for Duluth faculty in 2022. This project was codified in the most recent labor agreement reached in 2021. The work group first identified the market for Duluth faculty, and each faculty member was then assigned a primary discipline. This allowed us to pull in market median salary rates for each faculty member, and this data is now updated annually, so we are aware of market changes for that population. We are now able to easily run reports of Duluth faculty providing a clear work Force picture and salaries compared to the market for salary planning purposes. This new faculty refinement provides all four major benefits of a well-defined job structure. We are interested in developing more exact benchmarking capabilities for our faculty at our other campus locations as well. Our perspective, based on past and current practice, is that looking at both rank and discipline yields the most accurate picture of the market. We've recently received and reviewed a proposal from Chair B of the Faculty Consultative Committee regarding benchmarking of faculty pay, and we'll be scheduling a time to meet um, to discuss next steps. And with that, I will give this back to VP Horseman to discuss our senior leadership job structures. Thank you. Um, the top 46 senior leader positions are reported annually in May and are individually titled and, and researched um, to market um, each position. Salary ranges are priced against the market every year in accordance with the Board of Regents policy. These 46 positions cover cabinet positions, senior leadership, uh, including VPs, chancellors, and deans, and of course the president and the provost. The markets are national. As I said, the duties for each leadership position are detailed individually, often in a signed agreement upon acceptance of the offer, as well as the position description and, um, and uh, work expectations that are set when they come on board. This personalized attention gives us confidence that we have accurate titles for our senior leaders and a clear picture of where our leadership salaries stand compared to our peer institutions. However, given the change in turnover nationally present in higher ed leadership roles, the market will continue to adjust into the future. How compensation for higher ed leadership is developed and managed today may become 
even more of a hot topic uh, in the future and bring forward other tools to manage the compensation. Concepts such as variable pay, the metrics that reflect progress to mission will evolve in the higher ed space, I would believe, as they do in others and become a tool to manage competitive compensation along with financial stewardship. We currently have examples of how well that works in our office of investment and banking in our commercialization area, as well as um, in our development groups in UMF. In closing, the university has made tremendous progress in defining and refining uh, the job structures involved so that we can analyze our workforce, now know how we are paying relative to the market for our various positions and recruit and retain top talent. But this job never really is complete. For the future, our major product projects still include uh, completing market refinements for the research um, job, which should happen yet this fiscal year and the spring, libraries, education, and administrative job families. We need to complete um, faculty market refinements uh, for our non-union campuses, and we do that in partnership with the Faculty Consultative Committee and our, our faculty leadership. And we need to decide if we want to create a more formal job structure for a group of individual titles that currently utilize a salary floor. And that is um, a concept we're, we're considering for the future. So with that, we thank you for your time today and we're looking forward to answering any questions you may have at this time. Um, thank you for your presentation. Great, uh, I learned a lot from it, thank you. Um, are there any, uh, okay, Regent Gulley, go ahead. Um, you, this is very much my wheelhouse, so I have quite a lot of questions, so I'll try to consolidate them if possible. Um, first of all, Chair, thank you. <laughs> thank you for your presentations. This is really enlightening and, um, and really interesting to hear about how you all um, think about this. Um, as a former PNA um, employee myself and a former teaching specialist um, and someone who works in, in you know, with unions and organizing and um, all the time, like this is incredibly important to me. Um, so um, I wrote down about eight questions. I'm gonna try to consolidate and I'm gonna try to ask them in a, in a way that- I'll limit to one question per, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> like, I get you. <laughs> get it. Okay, so um, I have heard from folks that, um, and we've talked a lot about peak, so I'm gonna start there, um, that union represented positions are being eliminated and then they're turning into civil service Okay, that's not an accurate way of saying that, so let me try to rephrase this in a way that, that won't sort of immediately uh, shut down the conversation. Um, folks who have been in union represented positions, are they're losing their positions. Um, I've heard this from several places. And then they're being rehired into positions that are now deemed civil service. Um, um, I'd like to, if it's possible, ask a few questions together just to sort of group them. Um, but I, I wanted to ask, first of all, can you talk about that and why you think that those positions are suddenly civil service rather than labor represented? Um, uh, my second question, um, again, give me a second because I'm trying to like make these make sense together. Um, can you differentiate between what makes someone a labor represented position, especially in these like administrative positions, and what makes them civil service or PNA? Um, uh, I would love to know also how are we, oh, how are we setting market-based pay ranges? Um, I know that it varies tr dramatically based on departments and colleges. Um, and I know that the way that we consider what it means to be market, you know, market-based pay really depends on what we're looking at for comparison um, and how we think that people are valued, right? If we look at, um, you know, I'm actually not gonna like just throw out like possible because I don't want, you know, 
to get sort of lost in the weeds, but I just want to say, you just want to ask, like, what, how do we differentiate or how do we um, make assessments about market-based pay? Um, and I, I can repeat these questions if it's helpful, but um, how are we working with the unions on the new legal requirements? I know there was a ULP filed by the Teamsters a couple of weeks ago on orientation, and I would really like to hear how we're resolving that. Um, I also heard on our campus visits that Huron is recommending that we hire more contingent faculty as part of PEAK. And I would love to hear what you all think about that. Um, uh, I talked about it, I have talked with PA faculty recently who have been sharing uh, their experiences, but this has been, you know, my own personal experience as well. That people are hired into PA positions that are supposed to be temporary that end up being long term and never have a pathway to permanence, but they're sort of permanently in limbo in these positions, and how are we addressing that? Um, and then, what does it mean to have a $20.61 an hour minimum for instructors, because instructors are not paid by the hour, typically, in, at least not in my experience? Well, technically, we got an hourly rating, but it was actually not really, uh, it didn't really mean anything because it wasn't connected to the actual hours that we worked in any way. So I'll leave it there. <laughs> Thank you. And if you need me to repeat anything, please. Um, I appreciate you. Uh, Chair Hitz, uh, Regent Gully, uh, thank you uh, for your thoughtful consideration and bringing forward some of these questions. And collectively, we will try to answer it. There may be some follow-up that's required. Uh, first, uh, with PEAK, uh, no one has lost their position due to PEAK at this time. We have, pe we have turnover, we have people that leave. They may leave because they feel there's something coming, but we have communicated as much as we can on this. And we have had a process to ensure that people who wanted to initially move as part of the program did not have to apply and could move across. Once that was done, um, we still had a need in the uh, operations centers in HR and finance uh, to hire for phase one. So we did post, and uh, those jobs uh, were not posted at a higher level than they are. They are uh, labor-represented positions. In, in HR, we have, I believe, 15 contingent offers out now based on the hiring process being complete, I believe uh, finance has a similar number. There are other positions related to peak going on in marketing and communications that aren't necessarily pulling people out of a unit, but are P&A or civil service roles, and those are posted. So those are not necessarily replacing a labor position, but they are have been analyzed that they're needed to provide the services that you relations will be providing system wide. Um, so that I think um, you know is a concern we've been trying to address since peak started. We have phase one going into implementation in December, and I do think it will take um, evidence before their own eyes of how this gets implemented and how it runs and how it uh, goes forward and improves as we go along uh, for people to have peace of mind on that. Um, your second question, I believe, uh, was about uh, the differentiation between labor positions, civil service, and PNA, and what defines uh, the others, and I'll start out, and then perhaps I'll uh, turn it over to Mary, who may have some additional dimensions to it. You know, the labor positions are defined by the labor agreement, mm -hmm. and so those have been studied over time and provided in that agreement, and they are labor positions. Civil service roles uh, often um, support administrative work. Uh, they work, uh, you know, uh, some of them can be supervisory. Um, they have uh, levels of decision making and independence uh, that perhaps are not as uh, prevalent in, in some of the labor positions at times. 
that may not always be the case. And P&A are exempt positions for the most part right now. Uh, that may change with the FLSA um, uh, ruling that is, is being reviewed and out in public comment. Uh, but those are exempt positions which are defined by uh, the Fair Labor Standard Act, and we follow that rule uh, in determining the, that uh, level of work. Mary, do you have anything you'd like to add? <clears throat> yeah, I would just add, um, when VP Horseman was speaking, he referenced a, a JEQ, this Job Evaluation Questionnaire. It's a 52-question survey completed by the employee and the supervisor and then evaluated by a department that reports to me. Um, that tool used to be used for union and civil service employees. And so as you accumulated more points, a position moves from a certain level upwards, eventually it crosses a threshold from union to civil service. When the job families um, were completed, the civil service employees were moved out of that tool and into that other structure that I showed you. There's still a moment in that um, point evaluation process where the role moves into civil service. So although um, we don't use the JEQ for the civil service employees any longer, it is um, looking at the responsibilities, knowing when um, the roles re reach a typical level of like um, independence. There, there's questions in there about novelty, the times when you're handling something new for the first time and maybe only one time. So there's different questions like this um, that help you ascertain that you've departed from that union space, labor represented space, over into the civil service space. Um, in many cases, those assessments are made with, again, the manager, the employee, and our team. Um, and that was the case, too, when we evaluated positions for the peak work. Many times, a role was um, teased apart into its uh, component pieces. And what we actually found in our group is that when we evaluated that new centralized peak position, many, many of those roles, um, we found many were um, union um, labor represented positions. So we actually had a, we felt a, an experience of seeing um, many new roles that were labor represented positions. And, and moving on, um, the unfair labor practice that you referred to, and I believe you're speaking generally about the new employee orientation question that has come up. Um, we have, um, as you know, a very decentralized system, and there are many different approaches to new employee orientation. There are some that are in person in different areas. There are some that are on demand. There are some that are remote. And we have, out of our office, surveyed every one of our campuses and units as to how they conduct that. And based on that, we have come up with an approach we feel is compliant to the new uh, legislation. And in most of those cases, things are going along rather smoothly. We haven't had issues. We have had a couple of, uh, a couple of units where uh, the Teamsters have uh, the perspective that it is not following that rule. And so that has resulted in this situation. And the only thing I'm gonna say here is now it is a legal matter and our council is negotiating with our council and we will see what the outcome is. Uh, but that's where that stands at this point in time. And then um, going on, uh, we have uh, the question about uh, term faculty replacing tenured faculty or faculty positions. Um, that is not a part of PEAK. Uh, there have been conversations on system campuses about enrollment levels. And we continue to study that as to what we can do. And, and one option is to have more students in these classes. Other options are to make decisions in the future about uh, classes that are taught, and there are outcomes from both of those. So I think some of what you're hearing is around those conversations because I think to the credit of the chancellors, they've been having them in a transparent way, and although we don't have a result for that or a, a way to go forward, we have to address it. 
and um, you know that that could have an impact on on uh, faculty in different areas as we go forward. It could mean um, uh, certain areas where we need additional faculty or faculty of a different kind. So I think that's still being um, studied. P and A faculty that uh, here are here year after year. I, you know, I understand that point, um, but every one of our almost 7,000 PNAs are here year over year on a one-year contract, and um, you know it gets renewed every year. So um, in that way, um, what you said, I agree with. The experience I think you're talking about with PNA faculty may be the nine-month appointment or ten-month appointment conundrum, where they're not here in the summer, and and there's certain impacts because of that, to benefits and the like, and and coming back the next year, and and that's a result really of the demand and the need. Um, if you had more, if you had an example, we'd certainly be willing to check into it and follow up and give a more complete answer to that. I think we had one other one on the $20.61 yeah, yeah. floor. Would you like to try that? That example was provided because I think your, your comment was, what does it mean to have a floor of 2061? And we would ask the same question. That's um, the reason why we want to move to more of a market-based market -based, um, medians that we can measure our faculty salaries against. So right now we do just use a floor, and most faculty, of course, are above that floor. But it, um, it's just a, a, a less than optimal salary management tool for certain. And you would ask the question, too, about how we set market-based pay ranges. Um, the first thing we do is we always want to define the market. For most of our positions, we define that as the Twin Cities Metro. Um, for other uh, roles, sometimes it's national higher ed. It depends on the position. We ask the question, where do people come from and where do they go to set that? And then we understand the, the role and we pull market data from about, um, about 40 published salary surveys that we purchased from groups like Willis Towers Watson, Mercer, Culpepper, um, just a number of different consulting groups that we have salary surveys. So we pull that data. Um, we run regression analysis, we have a formal salary structure, and we update that every January 1st um, so that we have the latest fresh market data. Um, Thank you. A just, quick follow-up, yeah. Yeah, a quick follow-up, if that's okay. Um, I was wondering, so I would be really interested in seeing a survey of faculty salaries because I, I know that in my department as a PNA, um, teaching specialist for a long time, uh, for one thing, like we didn't get paid by the hour really, so that number was sort of inconsequent. Like this number wouldn't connect to the way that we were paid because we were paid by stipend. So my pay didn't go up for five years, I think, um, and then it was sort of it felt a little bit arbitrary when it did. I mean, I was grateful, but it, um, but it was a long time, and um, and this number wouldn't have meant it wouldn't have translated. So. Um, and then I'm wondering too, what kinds of um, sort of follow-up do you do? I was a PNA teaching specialist, but I was also training people who had PhDs to teach the classes. I was doing like supervision. I was serving on committees. I was doing lots of other work that's outside of the job scope. So what do you do to make sure that the the scope of work is actually what people are doing, particularly in jobs where it's very easy for that scope of work to spread out. Um, yeah. Chair Hipsch, uh, yeah. Regent uh, Goli. Um, so what we do is um, we have our position descriptions and they're crafted by managers. Um, so when you were hired, it's possible you went into a certain position. And then what we do is we um, We'll look at how that role changes over time, and managers can resubmit those to be reclassified. Sometimes it changes the role, and sometimes it doesn't. Um, without knowing you know, your personal situation, it could be that you were doing the same role, but just taking on more, more um, 
uh, service hours, more projects. In those cases, um, we'll oftentimes tell people the fundamental nature of the work isn't changing. It's still, it's just the person's doing more and more. And usually in that case, you'll ask the question of just, is a salary increase warranted because the person's doing a um, larger complement of work? So I don't know without knowing the exact. Of course, yeah, of course. But, but I would say I was paid on a stipend basis, and and really, it's not. It's been a long time since I've been there, and I. But mm -hmm. I do feel like if that was something that was happening to me, in my job, that it's very likely happening to other people as well. So, I would be interested to know what kinds of guardrails you have around that, and how you, um, you know, ensure that the job that you think people are doing is actually the job that they're doing. And the stipends are competitive, and if it's a stipend that it remains competitive. It was $3,500 a class. Mm -hmm. So I don't know that that was particularly competitive, but maybe. Um, I'm, I'm just, I would love to have a, to continue this conversation and have some follow-up. So thank you, Chair. I'll yep. let other people Regent talk. Turner. I'll keep it simple. Okay. I, I believe I, you alluded to how you, the, um, we had a wonderful lunch with some of the faculty. I'm curious as to uh, the market base is, in my world, it's called benchmarking. Yeah. And um, I'm curious as to the pool. You kind of alluded to some studies that you, or some surveys of yeah. groups of people. Like, is it the top 10? That you that when you're trying to figure out the salaries for our faculty, or do you go to the top 30? I heard top 40, or are you taking from every little college all across the United States, kind of pulling in the ones in um, Hicksville, Tennessee, and things like? No, I hope nobody's from Tennessee. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, because because it, the more the broader the pool. And the more you're pulling in from all these other circumstances and from all these other states, it seems like the number goes down, 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 yeah. down. So um, Chair Hips, uh, Regent Turner, um, what our team has done, um, we, you know, recently um, the um, peer group stated for each campus was different and it was developed on that campus, for that campus, for more than just compensation comparisons. So there were fields of study, there was aspirational peers that they had some programs that perhaps we wanted to pursue ourselves. And for the Twin Cities campus, for instance, uh, given you were talking to the Senate uh, Consultative Committee, um, that included the AAU R1 schools, uh, the public schools, which are basically the Big Ten minus Nebraska, um, plus a number of other national public institutions. The issue with that is not so much a direct comparison if we have 34 comparisons. The issue is the population often results in comparing yourself to eight or nine or 10, or having a discipline that's not represented by more than three or four peers in that group, and then that's not uh, a significant comparison to make a decision on. So what we decided, and the board um, listened and uh, affirmed it, was to use the uh, Carnegie classification, which is 146 R1 institutions. So. Uh, at the same research level as the University of Minnesota. And we have done that now for the last year, maybe two years, and we feel it allows us to have that comparison for areas of study that we will need to do if we wanna break it down like that. Now I say that with all due respect to Chair B, in their study they have looked at it by rank and um, have a perspective that doesn't really include wanting to use 146 schools. Um, I think that's an opportunity for us to have a conversation and say what schools are in there that may not be relevant. I mean, we're certainly open to that, but to use 34 schools or just the Big Ten for some of this will not result in a study that is worth much. I'll just leave it at that. And so we want to be very careful how we define that pool, and we want to be able to use it year over year. So thank you. 
Good. Yep. Uh, Regent Tad Johnson online. <coughs> thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you for your presentation, Vice President. Um, I just have a question, uh, and I apologize for missing uh, your previous presentation on uh, UMD. But my question is, have UMD salaries changed as a result of the salary work group uh, conclusions? Um, uh, Chair Hipp, Regent Johnson, uh, to this point, we have not uh, implemented a plan for that. We are in uh, mediation now with the UEA, and that is a point of discussion, uh, which, uh, which given we're in mediation, we each have different uh, perspectives on that probably right now, but we hope to come to an agreement. Um, the study was completed, and it, uh, you know, I think the results were shared, and it isn't uh, where everyone is at one level. There are some positions that are at market, there are some that are above market, there are some that are below that likely look like they need to be addressed. So I think that is the point that, and we can't get there, the university doesn't feel we can get there all in one year, so it's probably a multi-year plan. And that is what is now underway with the mediation uh, with our, our uh, labor represented faculty partners. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Regent Kenyanya. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you for the conversation and presentation. My, not really a question, just more generic, um, and perhaps not just to y'all, but to, as we talk about um, peer groups, um, I mean, I think that's an important conversation, and um, it's important to get the right ones, but you know, quite frankly, you can tell the story you want depending on who you put in there. So, I mean, I, to the extent we can think about how to be consistent in different conversations, um, you know, you made the comment that Big Ten's probably not enough for comp, um, you know, but then if maybe if we're looking at tuition, we might just limit it to Big Ten. And maybe there's reasons for that. Um, so not really a question, but I mean, if we can be consistent um, and just make sure we're not picking the, the you know, a, a group that supports uh, a certain narrative. Yeah. Any comment on that? Yeah, yeah I, uh, we, we both, I think, do. I'll just start out, uh, Chair Hipsch, uh, Regent Kenyana. Um, the, the benchmarking is a tool. It doesn't give you a strategy. So what we're making are recommendations and we have an opinion and a well-informed opinion. But for instance, we could look, there are positions like the president where I think the board has said we wanna look at the big 10. That's okay, what our job is is to tell you what the impact of that might be, what's the outcome of that, you know, what, are, what, is, what does that look at like from a competitive standpoint. When we look at faculty, we need more peers because there are simply, there's more to look at and some of them are fairly unique where not every school is going to have that discipline. Okay. So that, those are some of the differences that sort of make you adjust the pool you have. Uh, Mary. I would just add that um, you are correct that you can um, swing those numbers and whenever we do our work we have a guiding principle and um, it probably drives people crazy but when we have them in the room we say we're going to talk about the market and we're not looking at numbers and our compensation team holds very true to that. That's an absolute principle of ours, and we ask that of the people we're working with too, we'll say, let's talk about the market. Where do we get people from? Where do we lose them to? And we have that discussion, and sometimes it takes several meetings and a lot of different opinions. Um, we did that with Duluth. We've not done that with our other um, campus locations for faculty. And once they, um, we all come to an agreement, we feel good about what that market is, then we say, let's open the books. Let's take a look together. And um, we only have a couple of surveys for faculty, so we pull that open. They're, they're quite good. They're very strong surveys. We'll open that up and then go in after the data, but only after we've asked that question and answered it to everyone's satisfaction because it, you can move things around pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Our final question is uh, Regent Wheeler. Yeah, it'd be 
relatively quick. First of all, thank you. I learned a ton about this. And I know that there was yeoman's work done in creating these job families and the subclassifications to truly reflect people's work and, and to make sure that they're compensated fairly for that work. What I'm wondering is, on another comparison level, do other universities do this? And have they done it to a sufficient state where we can compare ourselves and what investments we're making in different job families? So I'm wondering, is there, is there a comparison uh, on a larger basis from the university side? Uh, Chair Hipsch and uh, Regent Wheeler. I would say that um, we're probably farther along with our job family structure than other higher ed institutions. We will. Um, be contacted frequently for advice. Um, groups like Wisconsin and other universities right now are going through the job family structure and study. Um, we also, too, are hesitant to make contacts to individual schools or groups because we feel like, again, that's not the full market. Right. But we do have a lot of published salary surveys where they've participated in those surveys. And what happens is in those surveys, you'll have your Twin Cities employers, you'll have your higher ed institutions that are participating, okay. groups across the country, and they start by framing the job, and they have the job very well framed, and then you provide your pay information about that role at your institution, and the other companies do the same. And we can tease that down. We can get right into higher ed. We can tease it down to higher ed and industry. We can see all of that. Um, but it's what's in, critical is that the survey company very clearly define that job like very, very well. And then people are very accurate when they submit that data about that job. Thank you. Follow up. No follow up. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation and bringing this all, all to our attention. So oh, no. look forward to your February. I think you said February you're coming back with more. So thank you. Okay. Uh, that brings us to the revised consent report. Uh, you have copies of the updated docket item summary, which makes clear that as required by his contract conflict management plan, Interim President Edinger did not have a role in developing the recommendation related to the farm project. Interim President Edinger, would you like to note that for the record? Yes, thank you, Chair Hipshaw. So one of the consent items addresses a proposed capital budget amendment for the farm project. Consistent with my conflict management plan, I want to confirm that I have not had a role in developing that amendment, and it is not part of my approval recommendation with regard to the balance of the consent report. I do understand that the docket item summary has been revised accordingly. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now over to Senior Vice President France to summarize the items in today's consent report. Thank you, Chair Hips, and thank you, uh, Interim President Ettinger. Um, so the October consent agenda includes uh, purchase items for goods and services, one real estate transaction, six capital budget amendments, and three schematic designs. I'll summarize these briefly, but in a different order, because some of them have been related to one, uh, other items on this in this month. The first is a contract to edX boot camps for $10.1 million to provide intensive hands-on project-based training to students enrolled in programs through the College of Continuing and Professional Studies for the period July 30, 2024 through July 31, 2025. The revenue that is generated from students enrolled covers the cost of this service contract. Next, we have one real estate transaction for you today, which is a lease agreement for office, laboratory, and storage space for the University of Minnesota Genomics Center. The Genomics Center <laughs> entered into a lease at this location in August 2020 and has executed extensions to bring the expiration date through this October. Today, we're seeking a three-year lease with renewal options, which, if exercised, would extend the lease to October 2028. The Genomics Center Lab Services Unit has grown by roughly 100% since 2010. These leased premises offer a consolidated and centralized lab, which is critical to the efficiency and speed of its operations. Next, we have six capital budget amendments for your consideration. These are for projects that were not ready for inclusion in our annual capital improvement budget this last spring. You'll note that your uh, docket information system says June 2022, which it should actually say is June 2023. The amendments are for the Carlson School of Management building revitalization, the third and final phase of HVAC replacement work in Middlebrook Hall, 
replacement of the existing cart and tunnel washer equipment to support research operations in the molecular and cellular biology building, renovation of space to support a new MRI for dental imaging in Moose Tower, and renovations to relocate and replace the outdated temporal bone lab in the Phillips Wagenstein building. This lab is where residents, fellows, audiologists, audiologists, and other medical professionals practice surgical procedures, hearing aid fittings, and other necessary skills that prepare them for practice. And finally, pre-designed work for the Farm Research Project Complex in Mauer County. And as noted by uh, Interim President Ettinger, he has, not, he has recused himself from th these discussions and decisions related to farm. But as we also mentioned this also, as discussed in September, this is an example of where we are proposing to use the proceeds from the Umore Park Legacy Fund to, to fund this pre-designed work. Finally, we have some schematic designs for three of the capital budget amend amendments or projects that I just mentioned. The Carlson School of Management Budding Building Revitalization Project, the work to support the new MRI for dentistry, and updates to the Temporal Bone Lab. And that concludes my remarks to consent report, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Vice President France. Uh, before I invite a motion to approve the consent report, uh, you are welcome to ask questions, make comments, or ask for an item to be separated out from the report to be voted on separately. Are there any questions, comments, or requests to separate an item out? Okay, I hear you none. Is there a motion to pr approve on the behalf of the board the consent report? Is there a second? Second. Is there any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. Motion is approved. Okay, informational items. So that brings us to the informational items. Uh, Senior Vice President Franz, do you have anything to highlight? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, our, our Central Reserve's general contingency allocations, we don't have any to report this month. The second, we want to provide you with our annual assessment management report. This report provides the annual performance results for our assets managed by the Office of Investments and Banking for the last quarter and fiscal year ending this past June 30. With that, I'd like to introduce Associate Vice President and Chief Investment Officer Stuart Mason to provide a brief overview of our performance results. Thank you. Go ahead, um, Vice President Mason. Thank you, Chair Hipsch and, and others. So the Office of Investments and Banking uh, submits a report once a year to update you on performance and other metrics or benchmarks that are embedded in region's policies regarding the several pools of financial assets uh, that we are responsible for managing. As you have reviewed the report from slides 274 to 290 in the docket materials, I just wanted to underscore a couple of highlights or takeaways for you and then answer any questions you may have. This year, all of the portfolios that we manage met or exceeded their long-term benchmarks. But the endowment this year returned negative 0.6 tenths of a percent, essentially flat, and fell short of its one-year benchmarks for, region, for reasons that I will elaborate on uh, shortly. But it too exceeded the three, five, seven, and 10 year benchmarks uh, by a substantial margin. Investment success is dependent on many factors, but most importantly, appropriate asset allocation framework. In other words, pick the right asset classes and pick appropriate risk tolerances. With that in mind, for example, the endowment framework attempts to knit together almost 100 investment managers and over 200 different funds, each with their own specialized expertise, into a cohesive strategy to achieve the long-term objectives. The region's policy for endowment establishes that the long-term objective or goal is to pay out 4.5% of the total each year and then grow the remaining assets by prevailing inflation rates so that future generations can receive a distribution large enough to continue the stated purpose of the endowment. This translates to a, uh, a goal of CPI, Consumer Price Index, plus 5% as a long-term target. Over the past 10 years, that would have been a growth rate of 7.8% for the endowment. 
compared to the actual performance of the endowment over that period of 10.6%, a positive difference of almost 300 basis points annually. So what does that translate to in terms of dollars? Slide 277 of your materials illustrates that during this past decade, the endowment has paid out almost 650 to 700 million dollars for endowed priorities. And had we performed at CPI plus 5% over that same period and met our policy objective, the endowment today would stand at $1.6 billion. However, the outperformance over that period has added an extra $600 million to the corpus, which today stands at $2.2 billion, and pays out approximately $80 million annually as a payout instead of the 45 to 50 million annually that the benchmark performance would have produced. How did we accomplish that? What, to, to what do we attribute our success? There's two answers that, that dominate. We've selected the highest performing asset classes during that period, that being private equity and venture capital, and we have invested heavily in those assets. And secondly, we have selected very high performing managers to execute those strategies. I refer you to the, what we refer to as the quilt chart on 283 of your materials, where you can see that almost every year the, over the last decade, those two asset classes, private equity and venture capital, have outperformed public equity and all other asset classes, with the notable exception that during this past year, venture capital has had a major correction and ended up being the poorest performing asset class. Mm -hmm. This anomaly in our one-year return resulted in our one-year return being the negative 0.6 tenths of a percent, or essentially flat, as all other asset classes were positive and they offset the minus 17% that venture capital produced last year. Last year, uh, excuse me, lastly, I want to remind you that the Regents' policy governing the endowment was updated <laughs> recently to include, among other refinements, a directive to integrate ESG principles, including DEI objectives, into the investment process and to expand somewhat the reporting on those activities. Slide 285 of your materials, we have highlighted some of those uh, successes over the past year. We've invested $154 million in ESG-aware public equity funds. 40% of our managers are signatories to the UNPRI, or Principles of Responsible Investing Initiative, as is the university itself, being one of only eight higher ed institutions in the country to have become a member of PRI. During the last year, we committed $45 million to funding two of the largest renewable power producers in the United States, producing new wind, solar, and battery storage facilities. And we committed to six women or diversity-owned or emerging investment managers during the course of the year. So mission accomplished. Uh, with that, uh, Chair Hibsch, I stand to answer questions on any of the other pages that I I didn't cover in detail. Well, thank you, uh, uh, Vice President Mason. I just also want to thank you for being such a star employee and <laughs> doing your job so well. I mean, to add six hundred million dollars to uh, you know our, our endowment over the last whatever years is really impressive, and and you surround yourself with really good people. And I just want to compliment you. You're going to be very much missed as you retire here, but thank you so much. And Vice President France. Oh, oh, thank you, Chair Hips, and thank you, uh, Associate uh, Vice President uh, Mason. Uh, I too want to echo that uh, support for the great work you've done. And this is one of those cases where it doesn't matter who you want to benchmark the university against. You can pick any group in the country you choose. And, and the Office of Investment and Banking has, is at the top of all of those lists. And a talented, yeah, that's, yeah.
and, it, and I know it takes it, a village. <laughs> I know, no, that's my next comment. I knew you'd say that because you're you're uh, very supportive of the team of the Office of Investment and Banking, and they they uh, deserve a, a lot of the credit for supporting you and and doing the due diligence that's required. Uh, I mean, it's always difficult. You you have a lot of options and uh, decisions to make, and I know you use a great uh, team approach to doing that, which requires a strong team over there, and you've, you've developed that team. And as Chair Hipsch said, we are so thankful for your leadership and the role you've played in helping this institution help fund the very reason we're here for teaching and research and service. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any uh, questions for... Vice President uh, Mason. I, I would just say, if he used me as a peer group, the numbers would look even better. <laughs> 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 well, anyway, thank you. Yeah. Thank you all for your support. Yeah, thanks so much. Okay, so there being no additional business before the committee, we stand adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Right. I think, uh, do you have some comments, Jason? The governor's. So the bus will be downstairs to take you to East Cliff.